I'm Robert Promisell. I'm one of the global portfolio managers at Resolution Capital. I'm really pleased to be joined today by Mark Kenny, who's the chief executive of Canadian Apartment REIT, uh, which is based up in, in Toronto. Uh, Mark, good afternoon to you. Thank you good for afternoon, uh, Robert. speaking with us. Thanks um, for having me. So uh, Canadian Apartment REIT, or CAP REIT, as we affectionately call it, is it's just under a $10 billion Canadian market cap. It owns a portfolio uh, in multiple jurisdictions that totals about $15 billion in, in asset value. Mark, uh, it, it's great to see you. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your port, for, your portfolio footprint um, and, and why you have uh, constructed the portfolio that you have today. Yeah. So CapReit, um, early in our origins, uh, fully appreciated the importance of diversification. And not just diversification in the quality of the asset in the market that it's serving, but the geographical diversification. So Canada is the kind of country <laughs> where really our provinces are essentially different, different countries in, in a way, because the legislation in each province is very, very different. And in some provinces, it's more favorable to be a landlord. Therefore, capital flows are, are more easy. And in some provinces, it's, it's more difficult to be a landlord where capital flows aren't there. So Capri learned very quickly how to adapt in multi-jurisdiction and which took us coast to coast in Canada uh, over time made us the largest REIT by market cap in the country. And it wasn't much of a stretch for us to appreciate the same sort of dynamics of, of regulation in markets like Ireland and the Netherlands. And that's what took us overseas. So it's quite interesting. You know, we think of the world as a big place, but quite frankly, when our when we get on an airplane to visit our regional teams in Vancouver, it's a five hour flight. And when we go to Dublin, it's it's almost six. So it's just not that far away um, in the context of the world. Amsterdam, we're there in seven. So we quickly, quickly learned how small the world was and, and, and saw a real opportunity in those markets. So some of the things I'm hoping we could talk about are the nature of the demand for uh, for your properties. And also, if you could also address, as you mentioned just now, regulated, uh, you operate in a number of regulated markets uh, and, and would be very interested to hear how you see that as an opportunity and frankly, what some of the limitations may be. Okay. So Capri, the, the, the initial portfolio was a uh, legacy product. What does legacy product mean? That means product in Canada that was really built for our immigration waves in the fifties and the sixties. Okay. Many of the properties that we own today were built during that era. And the original business plan was to buy those assets, reposition those assets to fully um, uh, take advantage of market rent, and which had, wasn't done in private ownership until, until um, the, the years that we started the business. The problem with the business uh, that was perceived as a problem that we saw as a tremendous opportunity is that when rents are regulated, you're, they're subject to a guideline increase that the province uh, determines on an on a annual basis. You can't go to market. So typically we see rent increases in the 2 to 3% range, uh, and that's all we can give our sitting tenants. Where we can take advantage is when the units turn over, they give notice, and we can go to full market. So many saw this as a challenge. We saw it as an incredible opportunity because when you looked at the real estate itself, because of the regulated holdback in rents, we were buying buildings at 50% of replacement cost. So as a result, nobody could compete with us. We can't build buildings at 50% of land and 50% of build cost. So it really created an absolute uh, guaranteed market. Now that issue, Robert, as time has gone by, has got even more favorable for us in the legacy product, okay? So many of our buildings today are, are uh, even at today's valuations, 30 and 40% of, of replacement costs because they're valued on income, not on the cost to build the asset. Right. What we've observed in some of the, the regulated markets that we've, we've seen around the world is that um, tenants understand a deal when they have one. And when they move into an apartment where the rents are, are regulated by, by government guideline, typically they'll stay longer than if they're in a, an apartment uh, that is at market rent. So it's interesting, we were talking earlier, you were mentioning how your typical tenant stay is four to five years, but you really look at the churn, which has changed quite a bit. Can yeah. You expand on that. Yeah, so when we did a 40 year look back at apartments in Canada, 
you would typically see um, an annualized uh, notice rate or people leaving their apartments of 35% of the, of the tenancies would turn over for the portfolio on an annualized basis. That, that's the 40 year average for the industry. Okay. What we've seen in the last five years is that in the case of cap rate, our churn rate has dropped to 15% of the units. It's well, well below. Now, why is that? To your point, real estate values in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal are primary markets. Single family home values are now getting in that threshold of a million dollars plus. And when you compare that to a cap rate rent of $1,500 a month, it's unbelievable affordability, unbelievable affordability. So what we've made up for, though, is as those churn rates have dropped, our market rents have gone up substantially so that the combined math is actually better in this low churn rate. And as that stays, we have a much, much longer uh, runway of opportunity as time goes by. The value stays in the building. And so how do you um, how do you measure your reversion today compared to five, six years ago? Um, it's, 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 well, five or six years ago, if you look back, we were averaging on, on turnover, something in the neighborhood of 5% increases in rent and pre pandemic, we were pushing 16% increases in rent portfolio wide. You know, we have averages of 30 in some buildings and light smaller in others, but the total combined, um, uh, mark to market potential was in excess of 15. Right. We have something crazy that's happening with the pandemic that I'm happy to discuss. But we know that that rate has gone much, much higher than pre-pandemic, even though it doesn't show in the results right now. And I can explain it's a cultural thing. It's really interesting because in the past year during the during the pandemic, the rate has compressed back down to mid single digits. So I'm actually really interested in understanding uh, what you've just said and how it's it's It's, greater than it appears. It's it's not what people think. Okay. Okay. So there appears to be a demand issue, but our primary markets at Capri are Toronto. Vancouver and Montreal. Now, culturally, what happened in Canada that was different actually even than the US and probably in a lot of places is when the pandemic hit here, the under 30 uh, age group went home. Now, in the US, you don't see that because a lot of the under 30s, their mom and dad might be in Seattle and they're working in New York or people in the US culturally tend to move around the country. Canadians live within an hour and a half of their parents. It's just, we only have three big cities and culturally speaking, this is what happens. So our uh, portfolio became exposed to the phenomenon of literally millions of under thirties going home to wait out the pandemic. Now they're coming back and it, we keep getting stalled out a little bit with uh, further waves, but you know, Capri is based basically back to historical occupancy of plus we're getting very close now to 99% occupancy. Yeah. And 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 so it's very quick return. Now we're in the in the in the process of lifting those market rents, which has been a steady curve up since the second quarter of last year. So we're now we're now into double digit rent increases again. We're not at that 15 percent, but we're extremely confident that those rents are going to be uh, far surpassing where we were pre pandemic levels as the under 30s come out of the basement. <laughs> OK, so you sound pretty constructive on the outlook. Um, yeah. But you're not sitting still either. Uh, you know, in addition to having guideline rent increases, you can uh, actively uh, manage your assets and invest in your assets to improve the the rate of rent growth. Is that not true? How does that work for you guys? Well, it's a constant balance. So on the revenue line with apartments, there's really three three things you want to think about. Uh, occupancy is the one we just discussed. Mark to market rents. We've just touched on that. And then the use of incentives. And, and this is something that Capri has never done uh, in any sort of material way in our history, that during the pandemic, with literally millions of under 30s going home, it became highly, highly competitive to find a market that wanted to move in to the big city where the virus was the most active. So the phenomenon in Canada has been this explosion of interest in the, in the, in this, in the uh, submarkets. And the cities, while the virus is active, it's not a very comfortable place to be, you know, especially in our case in Toronto, where you can't go to restaurants and you can't uh, ride the subway and you can't do a lot of the things that people enjoy doing in a big city. It's on hold for now. Now, what we did see, Robert, is for that window, you call it the Q3, beginning of Q4, where the virus had dropped substantially, people were coming back in waves to the city, like major waves. 
Right. And in addition, though, that, that that's interesting. We've seen a return to urban centers in, in other markets in the U.S. And, and whatnot. And frankly, it's really heartening to see everybody just kind of get on with things. Yeah. Um, but you guys are also actively investing in your properties and you're able to, if I understand correctly, you're able to um, pass on some of those costs or obtain a return on some of those costs uh, through increasing your rents above what the guidelines would otherwise uh, permit. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's limited. Like Ontario is our primary market and in the yeah. province of Ontario, when you make capital expenditures, there is a formula to where you can recoup some of those expenses. Now it's limited to 3% rent increase per year for three years, it's capped. So, you know, so the work that we don't, we don't all, we don't do it around that return. Um, sometimes that work is just required given the age of the assets, but there is some recoup above these basic guideline increases that you can get above the guideline. So we make those investments in part for that reason, but also for the market rents and also for the long-term viability of the assets. And then, um, you know, 2022 looks like it's going to be a good year in part also because some of the rent freezes that were in place have burned off and you're able to uh, return to a more normal uh, rent guideline increase uh, uh, situation. Yeah, like in 2021, um, I'm sorry, in 2020, Capri voluntarily ceased rent increases. We felt that it, it was the right thing to do. It wasn't a government um, mandated measure. Uh, we were being very mindful of, of the effects of the pandemic. What followed was in 2021, uh, the province of Ontario, our primary market, did freeze rent increases. <laughs> so we've actually been through two years now of no rent increase for sitting tenants. Now in the province of Ontario, that dropped off effective January 1 of 2022, and mm -hmm. every tenant has been served a rent increase now for January 1. So it's an unusual year where it's not a big rent increase, um, it's 1.3%, but we collect it for the whole year starting January 1 instead of getting it on effect. anniversary dates throughout the year. That's a right. positive. Sure. That's great. And then, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about your company as well is you're, you're in, uh, invested in probably one of my favorite uh, asset segments, manufactured housing communities. You have 12, 13,000 uh, home sites in your portfolio represents um, probably five, six percent of, of your rents, maybe six percent of your rents. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit different than uh, high rise multifamily develop, uh, uh, living. Can you talk about why you're, you're interested in that segment and what it does for your company? Yeah, I, I, I love this area as well. Like had I known about this sector earlier in my career, I probably would have tilted my interest there. But um, the manufactured home business in the United States is enormous. I think like somewhere close to 20% of the population at some point lives in a manufactured home. It's, it's quite staggering. In, Can in Canada, that number is less than 1%, okay? What's interesting about Canada though, is that we don't have natural disaster risk, which sounds crazy, but hurricanes and tornadoes actually destroy your income stream in, in a manufactured home community, okay? It's, it's actually a real issue. And we don't have a movement of homes. In, in other words, most of our communities are in remote areas where there is no other option to move your home. The US, it's quite often you see people taking their home, moving it from one part to another. That just simply doesn't happen in Canada. We have less than 5% turnover in our communities in Canada. And that's primarily around homes that are obsolete, okay? So the business is basically, we rent the land, the person owns the home, the resident owns the home, and we're aligned. So that we're a partnership where they have a financial interest in their housing, we have a financial interest in their housing, and it's very much aligned in what's in the best interest of, of the community. It, you not only get a higher cap rate, for reasons that I don't understand in Canada, but we're, we're the second largest owner of these in, in, in our country. The cap rates are higher because they're remote locations, I think, um, for one. And uh, yet the overall returns are, are far superior. It's far more stable than apartments where you can have periods of occupancy change and market rent change. These rents are all at market, um, so there's no instability there. And when homes do get removed from the sites, we, we put new homes in and make home sale profit that's quite substantial. It's not included in our underwriting. You know, we also participate in home sale uh, commissions for all of the homes that are in 
uh, the communities, but it's, it's just a great business. Just not, we can't get enough of it. What, what type of rent growth are you able to obtain in, in that segment? We, we average in that segment about four and a half percent annualized. Considerably rent. better than yeah, the longer term. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, and I know that you have an uh, interest in growing that segment uh, yes. when possible. Yeah. yeah. It's it, unfortunately, Robert, we are the dominant buyer of these communities in Canada. And it's despite being the dominant buyer, the, the, the growth rate of that portfolio is slow because there's not that many communities. It's again, not like the US. We, we really are undersupplied. Right. Um, well, that's great. Um, maybe you could just sum up and tell us what you see as the, the, the major opportunities for you over the next couple of years as we continue to exit this pandemic. I think that the um, we've been very focused on acquisitions at Capri um, for, for many years. Um, none of us are financially compensated for that at all. Um, it, we've always done acquisitions that are only accretive and, and uh, really focused around growing earnings per share. Um, the bulk of my net worth is invested in Capri. The, if I say to people, I own a bicycle and I own Capri, so I'm highly, highly aligned with shareholders in terms of uh, what to do. Um, although bicycles have gone up quite a much in, in value here. Um, I, I would say that uh, there might be an opportunity on the disposition front. Um, we're seeing a market where um, apartments are trading at, at never before seen levels. At the same time that interest rates are rising, uh, the market really um, it, it loves multifamily. And uh, I can see a case where um, if we've held assets for a long time, uh, feel that we've maximized value and we can seize uh, an above market valuation, we will be open to that. So that's a new opportunity that would be not material, but something that we're going to be looking at quite seriously. You'll hear some stories from us on that front. Um, and also so calling the portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, like I'll give you two. There's two examples of assets we've announced where they were we sold assets at a one and a half cap. Um, how could we sell them at a one and a half cap? Well, they were yeah. a developer that assembled lands. They were unique opportunities. Um, I could recycle that capital all day long, far more efficiently. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. taking selling stuff at a one and a half cap, it's not hard to buy a three or four. And 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 we'll be uh, exploring that uh, that approach uh, going forward. That's great. And then uh, one last thing. Um, and we understand that uh, with this pandemic, um, uh, typical migration trends have, have changed. You talked about it internally with existing residents, but also international migration trends have, have slowed quite a bit. And going forward, I believe there's the expectation that, that international migration is uh, anticipated to pick up uh, considerably over the next couple of years. Surely that's going to uh, be a, a real positive for, uh, for demand for, for housing in your key markets. Yeah, well, just just on the on the Canadian front, like we've got, as I said earlier, a history in Canada of immigration that's deep. Mm -hmm. um, this year, our government um, processed over four hundred thousand um, new uh, visa permits for people to become Canadian residents. So the inbound flow of uh, people coming to Canada is astounding. In our in our country, it's really if you're a new immigrant, you are either moving to Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. You're very unlikely to move to a small town. Uh, somewhere in, in, in Canada, it's unheard of. Um, so those are the centers. What the government doesn't have right here <laughs> that I've been an open critic of is you can't have responsible immigration policy without responsible housing policy. Sure. And we're, we're fighting a major housing crisis in Canada, like many countries around the world. And mm -hmm. there's been absolutely zero thought given to, to where people are going to come to. Now that is perfect for Capri. So I shouldn't sound disappointed, but it's disappointing government policy to not really embrace what, what's going to get more product to market here. There seems to be no solution. Well, uh, you are in the, in the good position of being long residential housing in Canada. So with that, Mark Kenny, thank you very much for your time, for speaking with us today. Mark Kenny, Chief Executive of Canadian Apartment Read. My pleasure. Thank you, Robert.